Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me pleasure to welcome you back to the 10K Collective podcast, the place to be for six, seven and eight figure Amazon sellers, particularly if you're based in the UK or Europe. Um, we have a great deal of guests that are going to help anyone in the world, though. So delighted to welcome a UK based guest today. So Neil Curran, who's the managing director of Regional Express. So Neil, warm welcome to the show. Uh, good morning, Mike. You, Michael, thank you, for, thank you for having me. No problem. Um, and uh, so tell us, what do you do at Regional Express, first of all? Um, so Regional Express are a freight forwarding and logistics company um, specialising in the e-commerce sector. Um, so our core business is helping international based sellers, um, predominantly in the US, sort of Chinese marketplaces, expand into European marketplaces. Um, and we offer any sort of number of services there from VAT, registration and tax filing services, um, door-to-door logistics and sort of general warehouse and fulfillment options as well for them. And so your sellers expanding um, to uh, Europe, which is obviously a huge uh, thing. There's lots of US sellers considering coming to Europe, but, but struggling with it. So today we're going to focus on potential pitfalls and issues for international shipping for e-commerce. So um, obviously <laughs> there's lots of uh, fun and exciting things that can happen with logistics, right? So it's yes. always reassuring to have an expert deal with those for us. So um, so I, do, I, I understand you guys do freight forwarding as one of the main things you do, so door-to-door logistics. Um, so presumably, even though, though you've got US-based sellers trying to expand to Europe, I'd imagine that the manufacturing mostly happens in other countries than than America, right? Exactly, yes. Although the core of our client base is US-based companies, um, we find that obviously a lot of those companies actually have their product manufactured in China or India. Um, So we offer, obviously, services to accommodate that from from Southeast Asia, from China, to to ensure we have a sort of global presence presence for our our customer base and giving them the the most cost effective and quickest option to get their product over to the European marketplace really rather than having to go China to US and then US to UK oh yeah that presumably sounds like it's going to wipe out any profit margin I I have have, there was one client I work with who's who's done very well she's quit her day job so it's always Mm. been the textbook uh thing that everyone wants to achieve but um, very bright lady, but she did at one point want to have some product manufactured in Australia, fly it to the UK, and then send it on to the USA until I pointed out that she would probably be amazing not to make a loss while flying products that far around the globe. So yeah, don't do it at home just in case anyone's new newbie kind of, you know, new to the space listening. I mean, I guess any, you know, anyone who's been doing this for more than 10 minutes will be slapping their head. It just goes to show how otherwise bright people can come up with some odd ideas when it comes to logistics. And I've been no exception myself. So first of all, let's talk to the typical supply chains that I guess we're talking about is stuff coming out of China, going to the USA, and then stuff come from China, going to UK and Europe, which is like your specialist bag. So what would you say, um, first of all, are the sort of typical, from the big picture perspective, the, the big um, pitfalls that people can fall into with logistics? And then we'll start digging into some of the details. Yeah, one of the obviously the biggest um, pitfalls um, sellers and customers that we work with generally fall into is, is the cost perspective, really, um, not knowing what their costs are for a new marketplace. Um, obviously, it's important when you're looking to start to sell your product overseas, especially in Europe. It's it's a big marketplace, and you need to ensure you know what your sort of firstly your tax responsibilities are regarding VAT and GT, and then obviously your shipping and freight forwarding costs as well. Because if you don't know what they're going to be, they can quickly eat away at your profit if you haven't factored them into your your sale price. Um, okay. On, on whatever marketplace it is that it's being sold on. 
So, I mean, in a sense, they sound like very obvious things. I mean, I, I did ask a very general question, but um, it, so it, I suppose that implies that you, you come across US based sellers who don't factor those into their price. I mean, is that really is that really the case? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, especially when you're talking about sort of import taxes and also sales VAT here in the UK. Um, it's important that the setter understands those those sort of pitfalls, what the import taxes actually are on the, on the cost of your product when you're importing it into the UK, and also what sales tax you have to add on to it when you're obviously putting it up for sale on a on an online marketplace. Yeah. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why we actually sort of created a sort of tax department here at Regional Express, really just to hold overseas companies' hands just to ensure they they understand the, the rules and regulations and so they don't come unstuck unstuck when they're when they're selling their product because obviously they're expanding to a new marketplace to ultimately make money and and they need to do that as best and efficiently as possible. Absolutely. Uh, why they need to understand or or get the assistance of a company that, that can certainly offer that advice and that so let's talk to the American listeners then, um, who are you know often a majority of the listeners of the, the podcast because it's such a huge English speaking um, constituency, I guess as well. But um, it, <laughs> let's talk about VAT first because yeah. I don't know why it is. I mean, I'm not claiming that VAT is easy, particularly for me to understand either as a European, but it somehow seems to blow the brains of, of most otherwise highly intelligent uh, American entrepreneurs I speak to. What, what's your experience of Americans dealing with VAT uh, and how can they best get their heads around it? Yeah, it, 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 is, a, it, is, a, it is a bit of a difficult subject when working with overseas sellers. Um, Mainly because, and quite rightly, they're based overseas, so they don't necessarily know the, the ins and outs and the requirements of, of tax compliance in other countries. Um, like I'm sure many UK companies don't know the regulations within the US. Um, Nobody example, knows example. the regulations <laughs> in the US with sales tax. Everyone's no. up debating it. So yeah, that's, that's 100% true, yeah. But, um, but um, it's, um, and, and because overseas companies don't really understand it and, and see it as a bit of a, an unknown quantity, it, it scares them. And they maybe as that regard, don't want to learn it or that possibly puts them off um, with their expansion to the European marketplace. But I, I can assure everyone listening that it really isn't as difficult and as scary as, as it seems. I know there's a lot of literature online that can sort of contradict and confuse at times. But um, if you speak to someone like ourselves or or a specialist tax agent it, they can really make the process clear for you and it really is just about understanding sort of what values you have to declare for your products coming into europe for the for the actual import customs entry which, which then obviously determine the amount of import tax and duty that you pay on that that particular shipment and then obviously when you're selling your item to effectively the end user um, you need to ensure you're putting enough sort of sales VAT or sales tax on your product to accommodate what you need to pay in your tax return to the UK government. Um, I mean, tax returns here in the UK are only filed every three months. It does vary throughout Europe, um, other countries, Germany, France, etc. You have to file monthly. Um, but again, that's why there's, there's companies like Regional Express out there that can sort of take care of all that for, for everyone. And, and really ease the pain of, of expansion, if, if you like. Yeah, no, it, it certainly can be. And I, I think I take your point, first of all, just reflect on what you're saying, the um, the unknown quantity, I guess quite rightly, if you if you can't quantify a risk or a cost, then you can't do your projected profit and loss and, and cash flow above all cash flow, because that's what makes or kills businesses. Right. And and um, yeah. And then you suddenly it is an unknown quantity. And I suppose it makes sense to stay out of a market until you can get a handle on that. So let's try and dig a bit deeper into VAT. I and mean, I know you're not necessarily a tax specialist as, uh, as such, but um, you can put it in context of the supply chain as overall, which I think is valuable. So um what are what are the sort of simplest things you can say about VAT that you find that American based companies or business owners don't know about that is useful to them? 
give us okay. some top three or four facts about VAT. And you can stick to UK if you like, or VAT generally, whatever's useful. Yeah, so if we stick to sort of the UK marketplace for now, um, generally speaking, it's the same across the board. Um, but it, if we start with the UK, that sort of makes it a, a little bit clearer. It, it's important to know that when you're, 3.1 is when you're importing the product into the UK, you have to pay import VAT at the time of arrival. Um, that's generally paid on, on your behalf by, by the freight forwarding or, or the clearance company that is, is working on your behalf. Um, and it's important to know that the amount for the product that has to be declared to customs on import is effectively the, the manufactured amount. Um, so whatever you're, if you're shipping directly from China, whatever the price of the goods is that you're purchasing them for from the manufacturer over there. Um, if you're importing from the US and you've already sent those goods from China to the US, um, there are a couple of additional sort of factors you have to add into the, the landed cost of the goods, um, predominantly those being any sort of charges to get it from China to the US initially. But that um, that could be sort of discussed in more detail on a sort of case by case basis. Um, one of the big factors as well that a lot of people miss is actually import duty. So while import VAT in the UK is at a standard rate of 20%, um, import duty is effectively product specific. So depending on what the type of product you're, you're looking at importing, that will determine the, the duty rate that we pay customs. So it's important that you know your sort of HTS codes and, and that they're, they're declared correctly to your freight forwarder and, and on any paperwork that's submitted for import, um, especially as duty rate, rates can vary from zero all the way up to sort of 20% or so. Um, so there's, there's quite a, a variance there. So it's important you, you get the right um, HTS code so you pay the right amount of duty because obviously you, you don't want to be overpaying on import duty, but you also don't want to be underpaying as well. Um, it is also worth noting that depending on the type of product you're importing, there are some, um, some differing VAT amounts. So for example, if you're importing sort of baby or children's clothing, that's actually VAT zero rated. So there's, there's no VAT on that type of product. That also applies for some sort of food products and so on. But again, that can be determined on a case by case basis um, with the use of the HTS code for, for your particular product. Okay, that's interesting. So I didn't know that um, that you can actually end up with uh, some zero rated stuff. Well, I guess I'd heard of it and then forgotten it again. So what, what are the sort of common categories that, that the joyous news is <laughs> true for that is VAT is zero rated. So children's clothing, what, what else are we looking at? Yeah, ch children's clothing is a big one. That's um, <clears throat> quite big for the, the companies that currently work with us. Um, and also a lot of food products um, can also fall under that category. Okay, um, but excellent. It, but it really does depend on, on the type of product. So it's always worth looking at the, the HTS code. And um, there are government platforms out there that you can quite simply type the HTS code into and and sort of determine if it's zero rated or, or full, full VAT. So, so what would the process be? You get the HTS code first, which tells you about the import duty side, yeah. but the HTS code itself doesn't tell you about the VAT zero rated or no, not zero rated. It, 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 right? does. it does. It so does. If we, it does. Okay. So if, we, if we've got the HTS code from, from the, the overseas seller or, or our customer, um, we can also guide, if, if people are unsure, we can also guide them on, on finding the correct HTS code as well and sort of assist them with that. Um, but generally, yeah, once we've got the HTS code, we quite simply just find that in the customs tariff here in the UK. That will tell us the duty rate and it will also tell us any sort of VAT sort of requirements as well, whether there's any option for exemption or, or, or not. So um, let's dig into some detail um, and let's try and it's, it's, numbers on podcasts are always fun, not, but um, we'll try and keep it as simple yeah. as possible. Let's say <clears throat> I've got this coffee cup in my hand here. So let's say I'm importing this coffee cup from China. Um, let's say I'm paying, what I sell this for, I don't know, eight pounds. So let's say I'm paying manufacturing cost a pound and then I'm freighting it in for 
I don't know what fifty cents a unit. That's I don't know. So there's thinking dollars to start. This is this is the horrible thing when you're importing from China and paying dollars to your supplier, and then going into the UK, you just got to get you got to come to terms with the fact you're converting between dollars and pounds all the time, right? But let's say let's say I'm paying a dollar to whatever seventy five pence. Ah, oh, this is getting messy already. <laughs> seventy five <laughs> pence for my cup and twenty five pence freight. So I've got a nice landed cost of a pound. Yeah. So what are my import duty costs and what are my VAT costs on that particular item? I mean, don't care whether it's exactly precise, you know, import duty, oh, but give absolutely. me make it up. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's effectively calculated in two stages. The first calculation is the, um, import, um, duty. Yeah. Um, so you will basically take your landed cost. Um, yeah. so that would include, value of the goods obviously what you've purchased them for the yeah. value of any freight and the value of any sort of insurance so hang on can you run those fast again because i think these are the these are the details that we need to try and get yeah. so say so those again so you have the obviously the value of the goods the, the, yeah the, the manufactured price okay um, the shipping cost to the rival uk airport yeah. or port and um and then any sort of insurance um, premium or figure that is attached to that shipment okay uh, then, insurance all right and then what happens from there is that obviously we total that value up and that gets you your dutable value so you would then times that total by whatever your duty rate may be um for example um a lot of plastic articles are six point five percent duty. A lot of clothing articles are twelve percent duty. <clears throat> so that sort of gives you a, a bit of a broad idea of what the duty rates are. Um, okay. For some sort of goods, and then basically once you've got that duty calculation, you then take those three other charges that I've just previously mentioned, as well as the duty amount, as well as a VAT adjustment factor. Um, which is effectively your landed charges here in the UK. Okay, so and then total ha, five ha, of those revenue streams up. All right, so how do how do I get calculate VAT? So just feedback feeding back so people are clear yeah. on this. I got the value of the goods, so I paid seventy five yeah. pence, and I'm going to stick to pounds. For yeah. Americans listening, it, it, once you import, the, you're going to get a VAT invoice in pounds anyway, so you're going to have to get your head around that. So let's just stick to pounds, even though you're going to translate it from dollars, right? So we're going to make our piece with that idea. Um, value of the goods for manufacturing, 75 pence. Shipping costs, say, 25 pence per unit, this is. Let's yeah. say I didn't bother to insure it because it's only okay. a few fairly cheap yeah. um, mugs. So I've got a landed cost of a pound. Then that's my dutyable valuable value, yeah. right? Exactly. And then let's say it's 6% duty, so I'm going to add 6% of a pound, which is 6 pence pence so i've got a pound and six pence so far sure. um, how do i calculate the vat is that multiply all of that lot together for the yeah. vat so so you've got your one pound six pence at the moment which is so so the so, so you landed so you got the the um landed costs which is the the value of the goods shipping costs and the insurance plus the um um uh, the duty is the the sort of vat able value is that right or whatever the word is um, there is um you, you the vat you also have to include the effectively the landed charges here in the UK. So oh plus landed plus landing charges so um uh, if you're using how, how does that work um so that's that's generally based on the on the size or, or weight of the shipment um, and the sort of predefined um volumes there Oh, wow. if, if you're breaking it down for a, a unit example for, yeah. for argument's sake and to keep it nice and simple let's just say that's 5p a unit okay um, so there's based on the size of the that. consignment so it's a bit like when you're importing to us which i guess a lot of people well us people will be more familiar with but i've also like a lot of british based sellers importing to the us that basically if it's above two and a half thousand dollar value then you get a customs bond or, or in fact that number's probably changed recently um but um you know whatever that that number is um and below that, then you have certain ways of, of calculating GT. Uh, so the actual import process costs as distinct from the import duty. Um, so it sounds like it's quite a similar thing, but in Britain, it's based on the size of the consignment, not the value of the consignment. Is that right? Or is it? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Change. That's very important um, because I think that's different, isn't it, from the, the US way of doing it. Is that right in your experience? Um, my US experience is a little limited. Um, sure. So, um, but yeah, I, I know they have a sort of threshold. Where 
Yeah, I mean, again, I'm no, I, I'm not, I'm not, entry. I'm not shifted whole containers there personally, yeah. but so I yeah. like, don't don't have a a great uh, understanding myself. But I do know that basically, you know, from experience, that it's it's value based. So that's quite important to to know about that mm-hmm. if you're calculating that. So, yeah, it's what sort of typical. If I let, let's put um let's put a bit more of um something to the picture. Let's say that I've looked at the unit yeah. cost so far, but let's say I've got a consignment of um I don't know whether you'd measure it in sort of pallets or you know if you're looking at uh, um, mugs. I'm maybe starting to regret this, yeah. this example. I'm no, shipping no, a lot no. of air with my mugs. Uh, but let's Not, say I've got 25 cartons or something like yeah. that. Let, let's to sort yeah. of keep it simple. Let's for yeah. argument's sake say we've got an air freight shipment um, okay. Right okay. here in the UK and it's yeah. um, 400 kilos in weight. Okay. Um, the VAT adjustment factor that we would need to include on the customs entry would effectively be 40 pence a kilo. Okay. 40p a kilo, and that's the VAT investment, uh, VAT adjustment factor. Yeah. factor. Wow. So and this... that, that's £160 <laughs> effectively that you'd be adding on to the, the import entry. Okay. So 40p a kilo. So let's say that they, uh, I don't know what this weighs, 200 grams. So let's say, and again, Americans, you're going to have to get your head around the fact that we use the metric here. Mm. Even though normal people don't, they use pounds and ounces like you do, but... Mm officially we're metric country so you're gonna have to get used to that there's a lot of google just google it i trust you it it works okay um so yeah 400 kilograms so let's say that's uh um that's gonna be like 1600 no it's gonna be 2000 units which is actually not that many um so okay cool so i'm importing 2000 mugs um so i'm gonna have that so so how's this looking so far so the vat valuable the vatable value i've got a pound landed cost the um 6p import duties this is like that game when i was a kid don't forget the bacon it's like a <laughs> list that gets ever longer so you've got the, the landed cost of a pound you've got the import duty of six pence um then what is the vat going to be per unit this is in um, yeah, this you, scenario so, you, so you'd effectively t- multiply that by 20 percent and that would get you your, your uk vat Okay, so what's this 40p um, a kilo VAT adjustment factor then? How does that come into it all? So, so that effectively goes on as a total on, on the entry. So so let's, for example, say you've got 1,000 mugs. Yeah, um, I think I was saying 2,000 mugs, but anyway, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so okay. you've got a, yeah, okay, 2,000 mugs at 75 pence each. Um, so that's 1,500 pounds. Yeah. And then you've got your 500 pounds worth of shipping costs, um, which will take you up to 2,000, which is obviously a pound a unit. Yes. Um, you've got your your six p per unit duty, yeah, um, yeah, which will take you up to two thousand and sixty pounds. Yeah, so you've got those charges there all accommodated for two thousand and sixty pounds showing on the customs entry. Yeah, you'd have a total of one hundred and sixty pound or so on top of that, and um, for your VAT adjustment factor, so that would take you up to a taxable or vatable total of two thousand two hundred and twenty pounds. And then you'd quite simply just mo- multiply that by 20%. And that would get you a VAT, import VAT amount of £444. And then if you wow. wanted to you obviously divide that to get your unit price, you'd divide that by 2000 And you're effectively paying 22 23p per unit VAT. Right. You know what? <laughs> it, it's VAT is even nastier than I thought because I personally hadn't. I don't know what I've been doing for the last year. It's probably <laughs> this, but I mean the uh, yeah the VAT adjustment factor. Yeah. I, I guess I hadn't yeah. really hadn't really yeah. accounted for that. Most that, that would explain why the VAT bills vary a bit more than I was that, expecting. That's, that's that's where a lot of sort of especially overseas importers fall down. Yeah, and they think they quite simply just pay import duty and import VAT on the the cost of the goods. But it's not that simple. Unfortunately, it's not that simple, and you end up paying obviously on your your freight charges, insurance. Yeah, which is really significant as well, especially if you're shipping something as large as four container loads. Yeah, that can certainly add a a significant portion to your 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 import bill. Um, Absolutely, and and the thing is, then it's not. It's not so much with the unit economics necessarily, although if you're shipping something as, you know, as, as uh, they're going to sell for such a low cost as this generic looking mug here, folks, and available near you. I quite like it, actually, but it's it's not going to really, it's an M&S mug there, yes, it's got a certain degree of quality, but it's very, very mainstream. So maybe I can sell it for five quid, but yeah, then those pence is 20p here, 30p here starts mm-hmm. to add up because that might be your profit margin. 
but even if it isn't i guess the cash flow problem of having a bill for say twenty five thousand pounds when expecting it to be nineteen thousand pounds you know is going to yeah. be a substantial problem isn't it mm-hmm. and actually if i'm shipping something heavy i mean it's not untypical for the the freight costs if it's air freight mm-hmm. to be much bigger than the manufacturing cost right i mean if i'm air freighting these suckers across then i might be paying um, a pound a unit or something i'd imagine so i could easily double or more my vat mm-hmm. bill actually couldn't i so yeah. and i it, it's it it's quite important as well that to just to realize the import VAT, although you pay it, obviously it's a cost at the time of import, it is effectively just a cash outlay because you do factor in your the import VAT you've paid when you're completing your tax returns here in the UK. So that that money does effectively get refunded or offset against your, your sales tax. So that's that's quite important to know as a as an overseas seller. So it's not effectively sort of dead money to you that you'll never see again so it's a cash flow issue rather than the profit and loss issue then yeah exactly okay for for example if you if you import a shipment and you pay 500 pounds import vat and then you sell that item um, on an online platform and you collect in 1000 pounds worth of sales vat you won't then have to pay the uk government the 1000 sell 1000 pounds sales vat you've collected you'd offset one against the other and only pay the only pay the difference basically so i guess per unit again this is probably a simplistic way of doing it let's say i send this i'll sell this for five pounds the yep. vat on the selling side is effectively sales tax at that point mm. in things it as opposed to kind of like a, an import tax effectively uh, at this point then when i'm selling it i sell it for five pounds i have to put an extra 20 percent on once on vat registered right and then i sell yep. it for six pounds yep. five pounds comes to me a pound goes to the uk government so i've already paid 22 pence per unit in terms of import yep side VAT uh, I don't know even what the right word putting it is but VAT already one imported so in the effect I'm going to give the government a pound minus 22 which is 78 pence is that right overall yeah that's effectively correct yeah yeah okay it's also processed within the same sort of filing period then yes that's the case yeah the more i mean we are going to get a vat specialist to come on so we'll, we'll dig into some of this stuff a bit more so we probably can can leave that one there but i think um i can completely understand now why i mean i live here and i guess i'm used to vat you know to some degree but um there are some nuances that had escaped me even though i thought i had a handle on it i clearly don't as much as i thought and i could see why the americans would be scared off so um uh, again um it's like one of those things don't do this at home kids i mean it, I, I just whenever i'm speaking to um new sellers um they start talking about how to import stuff themselves i'm like stop use a freight forwarder this yeah. is not stuff for amateurs to play with you know um and and entrepreneurs you know especially if you've got some success behind you and you're basically being a solopreneur got a titchy team you get a very very bad habit of, of what chris ducker calls superhero sy- syndrome which is you think you can learn anything and like yeah maybe you can but you probably don't want a legal case against the uk government uh, as a result of your learning <laughs> so it's probably yeah. not an area to dabble in as an amateur right so i say this and whether you work with neil or whoever you work with i'm just pleading with you right now that not not to do this stuff on your own because it's too complicated and equally not to run screaming the other direction just hire a specialist and let them do their work yeah so that there's my sales pitch done for you but i'm saying that just because i've seen too much ugliness i mean um there was one new client i work with just as an example of what not to do who did his own um kind of importing via boat from china or some stuff and then it, it ended up in in folkestone i think uh or somewhere on the south coast and, and then they had to pay to get it shipped to, to get it transferred to a warehouse or something and then they had to pay to get somebody else to ship it into amazon it, it just became a colossal expensive messy drawn yeah. out nightmare and i said to them okay first of all you've got a coach that's me you're paying me you could have run this past me Uh, i mean do what you like but like why why employ me and then not employ me if you see what i mean and the the, the second thing is dude just use a freight forward they would take care of all that for you and cock-ups happen um but you know but at least it's in the hands of a specialist it's less likely so yeah that's right that's (laughs) that's one of the um that's one of the main sort of pitfalls that new new shippers or or new importers have when they're from china that they they have a sort of manufacturer do it directly and and i think like one of your your sort of colleagues or customers you've mentioned there um they send it to a rival sort of felix though port only 
and then they get hit with a lot of UK charges that are prohibitively expensive and, and effectively unknown at the time of shipping. And that oh, can yeah. have a negative impact on their, their sort of balance. Oh god, yeah, this this will completely wipe to any form yeah. of profitability whatsoever yeah. in this product. It was like a ten dollar yeah. product or something, or ten pound product, and and they had about a pound profit margin in it yeah. um, if they did it well, and mm. which is oh, is acceptable. Yeah. It's not a good margin. Yeah. It's not really a safe one. But I mean, it was yeah. it went like negative twenty thirty percent because, it, yeah, it was a total disaster. So yeah, I mean, and again, <laughs> somebody else in slightly bigger scale from the one of the masterminds um, exported a load of goods to America from the uk which had probably originally been done in china so it's kind of like the opposite way round to the, what we've been talking about but they got a container rejected uh, in the us and it got shipped back to them so twenty thousand pounds later they've learned not to do it themselves as well even though this yeah. is a company that's been in business for decades i mean so that they're, they're not dumb people and they're not inexperienced but they were mm. inexperienced at shipping entire containers out to to us in order for them to get imported into amazon so look anyone can make mistakes but uh, again the, the danger is to assume you know what you're doing with this stuff when actually yeah. there's all sorts of nuances that can really bite you in, you know, in absolutely the and we, we always <laughs> encourage customers to just also look at comparisons because i know when shipping from china there's a lot of deals out there that say free ocean freight and that sort of thing and that's not always the cheapest deal because if you're getting free ocean freight from the origin, they're going to be making those fees up somewhere else. And that's typically a destination. And, and therefore, you then get stung with very expensive charges at destination. And rather than using a freight forwarding company sort of from door to door, you will be able to offer a sort of consistent price and service throughout. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, this comes down to um, uh, a very important point. Um, I'm... So I'm just making some notes here for the show notes. Uh, as ever, folks, you can get the show notes at 10kcollective.com. I write fairly detailed show notes compared to the vast majority of podcasts. I mean, probably to my detriment, actually, but I think it helps for people who actually read it. So please go read it, especially with something as complex as this. Um, so, yeah, I, I was just going to say um, having an unpredictability as huge as not just financial but in terms of supply chain delays which can really mess you up if you go out of stock on amazon these days you may not regain that position if it's a competitive advantage uh, marketplace not quite as brutal in the uk as it is in the usa but it's not a great idea but you're introducing massive variability into something you're, you should be trying to turn into a predictable machine and, and for me that means you've got the mentality that you're trying to save you know a few pennies here and you're risking um pounds worth of volatility per unit yeah. Um, that says to me that you've really got your priorities upside down anyway. Um, obviously, per unit costs are critical, but the predictability of those uh, is really hypercritical. And we've been looking, some, there's been some very interesting work by Ashley Pierce, who I also interviewed for the group, um, for the podcast, I should say. I uh, find that as well at 10kcollective.com. It's the first uh, interviews. And he's a member of the Masterminds as well. And, and he's been working very, very hard to get consistency in his supply chain, to go the opposite. So he knows what his costs will be. He knows what he, he knows roughly what his sales volume will be because he knows his sales volume. He talks to the supplier because the supplier knows the uh, expected volume. They can then talk to their suppliers of raw material. So he's smoothing his entire path of the supply chain, minimizing cash flow bumps, minimizing uh, interruptions to um, stock and, and sales, right? So this is complete opposite mentality to somebody who's going to save a few bucks by ocean shipping from China and then discover, uh, as I have in my air freight once to, to uh, the USA, that it took four different people involved in the conversation to get these goods through customs once and that was a customs agent a customs broker and i discovered there's a difference between those two in the usa uh and um a freight forwarder and then i think i even had a somebody else i can't remember who the hell the fourth person was but it was just a nightmare on sticks uh, and it, i didn't it wasn't actually my uh origin the idea to change freight uh it was it was my supplier so the other thing to say is that for my horror little horror story there that it wasn't that big a financial problem but it was a pain that don't let your supplier randomly change your freight forwarding arrangements either because uh, is that something else you've experienced with the, your clients because i found that they they randomly changed it and it changed everything about the import process to the us in that case yeah, uh, yeah a lot of chinese manufacturers like to work with their own freight forwarder yeah um, so they will obviously try and push that but obviously it it also greatly depends on your sort of terms of purchase as well with that manufacturer, whether it's X works FOB or yeah. 
PFR, it sort of obviously greatly depends on on that as well as to sort of what service you can utilize from China effectively. Yeah. Okay, so look, we've mentioned air freight and, and ocean freight. Let's get on to that um, question. Um, what are the sort of critical numbers and thresholds between um, air freight and ocean freight? And let's let's just just to make it fun, <laughs> we put Air Express into the mix, right? So, really speaking, I think we have three different options, don't we? So, tell tell us first of all about the the difference between um, Air Express and uh, Air Freight, because I think there's uh, some confusion there. And trust me. Uh, certainly importing to the USA, the US import authorities do not treat them as interchangeable at all, which is when I had my fun problem. So let, let's talk about this and clarify it. What's the difference yeah. between Air Express and Air Freight? A absolutely, yeah. So, so into Europe, we offer a sort of mix of services, really, just to accommodate the customer's requirements, whether that's speed or price or whatever it may be. And then, as you've mentioned, um, a couple of those services are Express and also sort of standard Air Freight. Um, express services are great for smaller shipments. Um, so something you need over here quickly, um, that isn't too big because as soon as it starts to get quite sort of big or heavy, it's going to become a bit sort of not cost effective really, quite simply. Um, we recommend customers that they look to utilize the express service for shipments up to around 100, 120 kilos in weight. Um, so it's a small number of boxes really um, that door-to-door -door transit time can be anything between sort of three and five days depending on obviously customs formalities here in Europe um, so it's a pretty quick service if you're looking to just get a bit of a sort of buffer stock over to over to Europe quite quickly to ensure you don't run out of stock or quite simply if you're just looking to start small and just test the marketplace with a new product that's quite a good way to go um, the sort of slightly larger shipments that make express courier a bit cost prohibitive so anything sort of 120 kilos plus that also may be palletized freight rather than loose boxes and we can look at sending on a standard air freight service and that will go on your sort of standard passenger aircraft and generally speaking um, and in that process Although still quick, it does take a bit longer than Express um, Courier. You're, you're looking at anywhere sort of between five and nine days, depending on on the routing of of the freight, and also obviously from the US. More importantly, the the known status of the shipper, whether they're known or unknown, which can have quite a bearing on on transit times. Okay, so tell us a bit more about that then. Okay, so obviously. Um, security measures um, within the US, um, especially when exporting from the US. Um, ship is effectively even known or unknown, and that can be checked on the TSA database. Um, if, if you're known, if you're classed as a known shipper, your goods, your freight can effectively fly on passenger aircraft. If you're unknown, it has to go on sort of freighter only aircraft. And freighters are sort of fewer and far between, obviously, and whereas passenger aircraft, obviously, multiple a day um, so that can add a little that can add sort of 48 72 hours into your transit time potentially as well okay. as a bit of extra cost onto your your rate okay um, but one of the things we do do at regional express is um if we do come across a shipper that is unknown um we will obviously move that first shipment for them as unknown and then we will work with them to try and make them known for any future shipments Okay, so if they're unknown, that has to be on um, a, uh, cargo a cargo only aircraft. Yeah. Okay, okay, interesting. Wow. So they ship. This is particularly uh, if um, if you're shipping shipping from the USA, specifically shipping out of the USA into UK or, or Europe, right? Uh, yeah, right. Anywhere out of the USA, yes. Yeah. Okay. USA to anywhere you or, or anywhere else. Okay, yeah. so that would actually apply if they're also shipping to you know. Um, Japan is the other likely place they're going to go to as the, the third biggest Amazon marketplace in the world. Okay, interesting. Well, that's that's interesting. That's worth knowing. And again, this just comes down to the nuances. With with the nuances, with a lot of things, don't make that they make a little percentage difference. I, my experience of the nuances with freight is that the, the nuance on a piece of paper that or on, on a website you think ah oh, that doesn't make much difference suddenly results in major delays and big cost differences. Whereas if you don't have 
a wonderful photograph of a product, maybe you convert it a tiny percentage different and, and it's a kind of nuance, you know. It, it just always strikes me that when something goes wrong in the freight or supply chain generally, it's just normally nastier <laughs> in my experience. Uh, it, it sounds like what you're saying bears out as well. I mean, um, I, I would also point out just from personal experience, and I, and I don't know if you want to talk about this, but again, this was going into the USA, so it would be a bit different in Europe. But I had a supplier who'd been using UPS or I think DHL, one of the Air Express guys with, with their own sort of customs clearance channels. So I'd stopped using a, um, a customs broker in the US. Um, because it hadn't been needed and it was working fine. And then my supplier used some probably unknown, it may have been related to the thing you were just talking about, somebody who was not maybe a known carrier, but they had it in the freight section, but of a basically passenger aircraft. And when it landed in the USA, they didn't have any kind of clearance channel set up. <laughs> so is there a sort of UK or European equivalent of that problem? Um, predominantly not. I know, um... I know from a sort of express courier point of view, if a lot of overseas companies are sending their product on their own DHL UPS account, whatever it may be, directly to Amazon, Amazon obviously won't act as the importer of record here in the UK. Yeah. The goods do tend to get stuck yeah. at that point and generally return to origin because there's no one here in the UK to pay the taxes, um, which again, I think as you hinted on earlier, is another reason why you sort of use a freight forwarding company really. Um, or a customs broker to ensure they take care of that on, on your behalf. Um, but any shipment coming through air freight, um, standard air freight into the UK, obviously that will generally, as with, as with ocean freight, will be followed through by the freight forwarder to ensure that's customs cleared and processed yeah. in the correct and timely manner. I, I can't stress enough really, uh, I, I, I kind of sound like a bit of a broken record here, but it's just partly from painful personal experience and also watching clients, sometimes very experienced, as I said, and sometimes less experienced in, in yeah. and the danger is when you've been in business for like decades, you think you know all there is to know in your business and you do within a limited scope, but as soon as you go to a different country or a different supply chain, I, I beg you not to assume you know. Yeah, uh, um, yeah there's, there's just so many car crashes that I've seen and... Um, it's just a specialist area as far as I'm concerned. I think it's just a specialist. You wouldn't probably try and manufacture your plastic goods in your shed. Um, you know, yes, I, I do, did have one client who actually made his own um, kind of face lotion or something in his kitchen table because he trained himself to do it. That's pretty amazing. It seemed like good stuff as well. But, uh, you know, you wouldn't manufacture plastic goods in your shed. You probably shouldn't try and get goods across the world through different tax regimes yourself either. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of... It sounds like I'm doing a great big pitch on behalf of Neil, but that's the opposite way around. I've asked Neil on because I've seen this car crash. I mean, that's, you know, I, I can't stress enough. I don't care who you work with. I mean, Neil obviously knows his stuff and this is a chance for Neil to, to show what he knows. But but nevertheless, whoever you work with, I'm just pleading with you now, please don't DIY this stuff. It's so goddamn painful. You should be focusing on marketing, product development, strategy, not not trying to be an amateur freight forwarder. Anyway, yeah. enough of me banging on about that. Yeah. Um, what? So tell us about um, sea freight. Sea freight. At what level of units or size or, or weight does ocean freight start to make more sense? Okay, so ocean freight obviously generally is a significantly more cost-effective price per unit than than air or, or express courier. But generally speaking you need to send larger quantities to avoid sort of minimum surcharges and to, to make it extremely cost effective for you really. Um, so to make ocean freight worthwhile, you need to be sending at least one pallet really, um, at least one cubic meter. Um, otherwise you'll be generally hit with minimum surcharges by the carrier at that point. Um, so we always recommend obviously yeah one one at least one pallet two three pallets whatever it may be um if you're obviously a very successful seller and you're looking to move larger quantities in on a regular basis then obviously sea freight is definitely the way to go for you anyway yeah. um, and at that point if you are moving larger quantities there are different types of services that you can utilize and um, you've got your obviously consolidation services which are great if you're looking at sending a small pot small quantity of cargo because Effectively, freight forwarders like ourselves will receive a few pallets from yourself in, in origin and we'll consolidate that with other customers' cargo and, and share a container over to, over to Europe. 
Um, however, if you're getting to sort of at break points where you may have 10, 12, 13 pallets of your own cargo ready to move, you may well need to start looking then at full container loads that could start to be the more cost effective and quicker option for you. Um, and again, that service is offered by, by ourselves and we can quite simply guide the seller to the, to the most efficient and cost effective solution available really. So if we do see one of the things we pride ourselves on is if we see the sellers getting to a, a large quantity that may be more cost effective on a different option, we, we notify them of that. We say, hey, look, how about we do it this way? Um, okay. Sorry, go on. No, that's okay. No, I was going to just ask about these things. So consolidation, first of all, let's let's talk about that. So we're kind yeah. of moving up the chain of, of you know, the quantities and bulk uh, and yes. and weight. But I guess also that, you know, it implies the unit sales or that they're doing is better or the revenue is better. So we've gone from Air uh, Express to Air Freight to Sea Freight in general. So we've, we're, I guess we're talking less than container loads versus container loads, right? So yeah. um, what what is a sort of, break point i think we well, i think we talked about this in our, our um preparation for this actually what is the break point between um less than container load versus container loads um yeah. where, where does that come roughly it, it could it could be somewhere as low as sort of 10 10 to 12 pallets worth of cargo um so maybe around sort of 15 cubic meters or so so uh, so it could be 12 to 15 so actually um, 12, 15 pallets. So that's quite, what sort of percentage of, um, let's take a standard container, which is what the 20 foot standard container, right? Let's take one of those as the, the, the smaller end of things. Um, what sort of percentage of that is a 12 or yeah. 15 pallets that, full? That, that's going to, if you've got that sort of pallet volume, that's going to fill and exceed the space in a 20 foot container. Okay. Um, if you've got a 20 foot container, you want all for yourself. You Generally speaking, you can get 11 UK standard pallets in one of those containers. Okay. Um, what we do encourage sellers to do as well, if they do choose to go down the full container route, is to maximise the space in that container as much as possible. Because obviously yeah. they're paying for that space, whether they have 10 or 11 pallets in it or whatever, they're going to be paying the same rate. So quite often you don't want to palletise your freight before loading it into a full container load. You want to load loose boxes so you can really fill it up and make it as airtight as possible to yeah which obviously ultimately reduce your unit cost per product yeah and i guess a lot of this game just does come down to just unit costs really and cash flow yeah. and it's those those two things which is terribly unsexy really compared to the latest amazon hack but it's how actual real people mm. run real businesses that i know it's it just exactly. comes down to getting this stuff sorted and and again it's not just about the lowest number possible but the predictability of it again come yeah. back to the the thing we we're talking about okay you know yes in theory your chinese guys can squeeze extra boxes in and they're not and and it's cheap as chips to ship it across the usa but then you know if you can't unpack it it's it, or without damaging stuff then it's going to lead yeah. to angry customers if they haven't dealt with the import costs and in, in in america that's going to cause massive delay and it could cost you a load of money so again that there's cheap and then there's packed and then there's cheap but unreliable and there's packed but broken right <laughs> again you just yeah, gotta yeah. it sounds like the voice it sounds obvious but again you you've talked about it yourself that you've seen people you know with those those deals in china that they offer that i've just seen too many of those that that it's that penny wise pound foolish as we call it in the uk you know it's that you just have to balance different factors and and uh, yes. yeah it kind of sounds obvious but you know i'm banging on about a lot of stuff that's obvious in a way what the funny thing about freight that always always strikes me is on the one hand there's a lot of just common sense and on the other hand just a ton of things that you wouldn't have thought would be a problem that you couldn't even imagine existing <laughs> that do right yeah. that's been my experience yeah. of freight so um so what about, let's think about uh, a couple of things. So we talked about that sort of point. Coming back to consolidation then, that's slightly smaller than the whole container thing. Let me dig a bit more into that. How, how does consolidation work generally? So okay. So, so yeah, generally um, a freight forwarder will run a, a weekly consolidation, whether that's from location in the US, China, wherever. Um, it can be multiple locations across China, etc. They may have a container coming out of each port each week. Um, and basically, we or whatever the freight forwarder is will 
collect or receive the company's cargo into our origin warehouse um, example. So we receive a couple of pallets into Shanghai for a customer um, and we will load that into a container with anything realistically up to sort of a dozen or so other customers cargo depending on obviously the volumes they're looking to ship as well and that will all be consolidated in to the container and shipped across obviously by boat to arrival UK. Um, once it arrives here in the UK um, the container will be moved across to one of our warehouses here and de vaned into our warehouse. From there each individual consignment within that consolidation can be customs cleared and then released for collection and on the delivery to whatever the final destination may be. Um, all in all, it's a slightly longer transit time than if you were to ship a full container load, because obviously with a full container load, you've got the luxury of moving the container from the port directly to the final destination, whereas with a consolidation, it has to come to a, a sort of a sort of customs warehouse first, where it needs to be de before before being sort of separated and moved onwards. Okay, but but then I guess you get some of the economic advances of using containers. Exactly. Uh, yeah, well, it makes total sense. You, yeah. can, you have to have some compromises. Yeah. Um, uh, so as to transit time um, compared to um, to a whole container, which makes sense. Now, um, tell me about whole containers. You just mentioned um, shipping. You have the luxury of shipping a whole container from, say, let's say it's being shipped out of Shenzhen, Shanghai. It's not like one for basically um it's amazing china is just a whoppingly huge country with with a massive population but actually um such a big percentage of its export trade um goes goes yeah. down to four cities on the, the south coast right shenzhen guangzhou um what else um yeah. you mentioned shanghai i can't think of what the other one is but that those so it's likely to be from very specific destinations right but then let's say you're shipping into the uk can you take a container directly to the door of amazon uh in the uk or is if you've got to decon you've got to break it uh the supply chain anyway at some warehouse somewhere um yeah if you're moving a full container there are certain amazon fulfillment centers here in the uk that will accept full container loads um okay. we however do encourage sellers to unload a container at a third party warehouse initially such as ourselves and then forward it on a trader to amazon as pallets on the cargo at that point um, the, the reason we say that, obviously, because cargo in the container, it can shift, it can move during transit, obviously, whilst it's whilst it's on board a vessel. Um, and obviously, if, if you're delivering a full container to Amazon, the doors are only going to be open for the first time when it gets to Amazon. And if there has stuff which shifted or moved, they may not unload it based on health and safety grounds, which could add horrible expense to to the sellers outlay really so we always encourage it to come via a warehouse such as ourselves we'll then check it we'll repalletize it if needed and then send it on its way and again that's a classic example of that general principle that seems to emerge which is you know you might save some some money by going direct to amazon yeah. and it seems more efficient but if there is a chance whatever you got it's a kind of risk assessment is, is percentage of probability of happening versus times the size of the problem but if it's i mean what sort of size of problem if how okay so let me quantify those two things um how often does stuff shift uh if you're going directly and how often does it get rejected and what is the potential and the cost if it gets rejected yeah i i mean pre previously when we we did used to deliver full container loads into amazon fc's here uh we were getting a very high percentage of rejections okay um, sort of yeah sort of as high as 80 percent i would say it was, oh wow okay uh, incredible incredible okay incredible amount so we we quite simply made the decision and really do advise our customers strongly against it um because if if, if you do decide to send it direct to amazon no problem at all but if they do reject it you've then effectively got the, the wasted delivery fee for that container transport you're then yeah. going to have to pay for that container to go to another location and how, what sort of cost are you it. looking at for, uh, for that roughly? It, yeah, I mean that that can vary massively depending on where it's delivered to in the UK. Um, okay, let's take an example. That, I mean, let's say that you ship something to Peterborough. For, well, what, which are the FCs? Will I give an example of FCs where you could ship directly with the container? Let, let, let's go for 
let's go for an FC around the Midlands. Um, that's okay. what I use these days, sort of Colville or Coventry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from Southampton Port, yeah, you'll be looking at sort of a few hundred pounds for a sort of thing to be up to there. Mm-hmm. Um, if that goes wrong, then obviously that's effectively lost money. And then we've got to find an area or a warehouse locally or bring it back to one of our warehouses to unload that container and then make sure it's safe, reload it to another truck and then deliver again to Amazon. So quite quickly, your charges can spiral out of control and suddenly become sort of a couple of thousand within a blink of an eye, really. Yeah, so you got 2,000 pounds or something, etc. Yeah. Okay, good. So look, I mean, I think that great. You've, you've really, I'm glad that I followed my train of thought there because you qualified that very well. I mean, 80% chance of a 2,000 quid extra cost that that is an absolute no-brainer that this is not I mean, merely good advice this yeah. is like absolutely don't do it <laughs> do yeah. not ship direct to amazon right 80 percent probability of something going wrong is horrible i mean i, I was mean, thinking it would be like five percent ten percent yeah yeah i mean it, it it can be made right i mean if you work if from a if you're buying from manufacturing type china if you work closely with them over time there's absolutely no reason why you can't build build up the relationship where the loading is to a standard that is expected and okay by Amazon to be received. Um, so again, it, it's just one of those one of those things in the supply chain. You you can spend the time on it to get it right, and it's certainly in the long term it would be worth making it right. But for a lot of sellers who who maybe just import fairly sort of irregularly for full container loads and so on, and and just look to get it over quickly and cheaply, then. And maybe coming via a warehouse like ourselves is the best option. Yeah, that's that's really really helpful. I and mean, this is exactly why I try and get experts and just dig into the nitty gritty detail. Because yeah. if you're not selling on Amazon already, this is going to be boring as hell. But if you're yeah. selling on Amazon, you've experienced paying twenty thousand quid to have a container mm-hmm. shipped back to you. You're going to be flipping listening right now. Yeah. So, talking of, of listening, I'm aware that we've got to quite a longish episode. So I think we should stop there. But but um, okay. that's really um, just one more question on that um, question uh, of. Uh, having a number of units about multiple SKUs from multiple suppliers. Um, can you consolidate that? Because obviously that can, if you're trying to fill a container or get close to that, then that is obviously uh, sometimes means the logistics in China get nightmarish. Can you help with that side of things as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So um, if you've got four or five different suppliers producing in China, ideally you don't want to send four or five shipments you want to sort of consolidate those together into one so yeah providing on the location in china that's certainly a service we can offer to our origin warehouses we would, we would receive the cargo in there and then group it all together and load it for for you um generally if the um if all the suppliers are in the same sort of region so the southern china sort of the guangdong areas for example then absolutely it's no problem at all we can consolidate for you if you've got suppliers sort of jotted around china maybe one down in shenzhen one up in sort of Beijing area then obviously that's that's a long old um, sort of truck movement or rail movement in china to get those goods together so that may not be cost effective and that may not be the best option to go um, you may be better off sending separate shipments in that instance but again that's that's why companies like ourselves are here um we're here to guide on that sort of thing. We're here to take the lists of supplies that you buy from and then we can say, well, look, let's do it this way. This is the best option for you. This is the most cost effective option for you. Let, let's consolidate them or, or let's not consolidate them in this instance and, and sort of go from there. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, in the end, um, what it comes down to is a lot of complex calculations that end up with an effect on time or money, right? So in a way, as the as the Amazon business owner or the e-commerce seller, whatever we're going to call ourselves, I, I think I would really encourage people to just kind of think of it as a black box. Give, yeah. give the question to an expert freight forwarder, wait mm-hmm. for them to work it out uh, as long as you trust they know their business. And this is why, you know, podcast is such a helpful way of checking out yeah people's you know precision of thinking and you're certainly you know opening my eyes to a lot of stuff i thought i'd, I'd heard most of the stuff about this stuff but there's there's a lot of interesting stuff here yeah. and then once you've made the assessment i i think what you know what this comes down to and i just want to wrap the episode up on this one um they they often say like don't think how 
think who. So in other words, instead of banging your head against the brick wall of how can I become a freight forward expert and get the stuff out of China and LCL versus container versus air freight and should I ship a whole container to Amazon or whatever? I mean, we're informing you about all these things. It's important to know what the issues could be. But in the end, I think your decision is simpler. That. It's like, who do I work with to take all this stuff off my plate? <laughs> you know, because yeah, exactly. trying to do it yourself. And again, I'm, I keep saying this, but honestly, I it's not because I expect to make a vast fortune from selling any freight forwarder services to anybody else. It's, it's more like it's just such a whopping pain point that I've experienced, that my clients have experienced, that people in Mastermind's experience. I cannot stress enough that trying to learn how to do it yourself is just not the way forward. So I'm going to leave this episode on that thought Absolutely. and um, we'll come back to talk about um, lots of other things around the, the whole um, freight area. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Absolutely. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Well, what a great interview with Neil Curran there from Regional Express. Um, Regional uh, Express is clearly a bunch of people who really know their stuff. Um, freight forwarding is not uh, one of those sexy kind of topics like the latest way to hack Amazon and get yourself magically thousands of extra sales a month. But truth be told, the really grown up businesses have really sorted their supply chains out and those who experience horrendous um, interruptions to their cash flow and, and their profit are the ones who haven't sorted the supply chain. It's so critical. And what was really interesting to me is that I thought that I'd seen most of the issues that you get with freight from my own experience and my own stupid mistakes uh, and uh, corrections to those mistakes from working with mentoring clients. And again, having seen what they do sometimes despite my advice and also the 10K Collective and Million Pound Mastermind members who ship you know, whole containers quite frequently in most cases. What was interesting is that there's still so many pitfalls that I hadn't heard about, which would really, you know, do some horrible things to your cash flow, to your out of, being out of stock uh, and to your profit or, or rather shove you into loss rather than profit for a shipment. So it's just more proof that it really, really pays to work with a good freight forwarder and quite clearly Neil knows his stuff. So I've got a really nice deal from um, Neil for the listeners of the 10K Collective podcast. And here's what it is. If you use the promo code 10K when you get in touch with Neil, whether that's by email or through their website or on the phone, doesn't matter, then you will get the following um, lovely bonuses. First of all, you get VAT registration free of charge, which is worth a lot of money. Actually, accountants will charge you good money for that. Secondly, you'll get discounted rates on VAT filing, which again is really, really worth having. That can really add up. But I think the really significant thing is that any freight booking from now um, till the end of 2019 is going to be at a 10% discount, which could really be worth a lot of money if you're shipping some serious volume of goods. Um, that could save you tens of thousands if you're shipping containers, but it could save you some pretty serious money otherwise anyway. So um, the promo code is 10K and or just mention uh, Michael V's in the 10K Collector podcast when you speak to Neil. So really worth um, having that. But even if you just speak to him and get some advice and don't end up going ahead uh, and using them, uh, it's just, I can't emphasize enough how this area perhaps above all other areas in um, the entire business of running your own e-commerce business um, it's really something you want to get experts involved in. So I just plead with you to whether you, you decide to use them or not to at least talk to somebody like Neil. If you are shipping into the UK, particularly his specialist thing is if you're based in the US right now listening to me, um, they really are experts at dealing with that situation. And, and really um, the whole VAT thing can be a barrier to shipping to Europe. But guess what? If it's a barrier in the minds of your US competition, um, but it's not in yours because you've got a trusted person to sort that out for you, that becomes a massive competitive advantage. And between the UK and Germany alone, and never mind the rest of Europe, but there's a very significant market to be had, which is uh, substantially less competitive than the US. So it's 100% from a marketing and sales point of view, very worth um, getting right and getting in here. Um, and uh, exporting to a whole brand new marketplace. But you have significant challenges which you don't want to try and deal with on your own, so you wouldn't want to get to a freight forwarder. So every reason to explore it. If I were in your shoes based in the US and wanted to go into the UK, I would 100% just send an email to Neil and say, right, let's talk. So that's what I advise you to do. Either which way, thank you so much for listening and speak to you in the next podcast.